Okay, we are live in our very first The Thinker's Lounge live session here on Facebook. I'm very excited to have a very special guest with me, Dato David Gurupatam, who is the co-founder and managing partner of David Gurupatam and Quay, advocates and solicitors. So uh, I'll be your host for tonight. Uh, my name is Ching Yu. Some of you uh, may already know me from uh, my YouTube channel, but it's my intention to uh, create more regular content here on Facebook Live so that I can deliver uh, more value to you. So yeah, let's just jump right, right into it. Uh, CMCO, I see that uh, your firm uh, is already prepping up uh, for or what's to come with all of your IT guys uh, on, on their laptops? Yes. Yes, uh, we are. Uh, I mean, we've been through a lockdown before. Uh, naturally, like everybody else, uh, the safety of people uh, is paramount. Uh, the safety of our staff is paramount. Uh, we believe in complying with the uh, authorities and their regulations and SOPs, trying to keep everybody safe. Uh, and uh, like other businesses, uh, we are more prepared now uh, to conduct uh, meetings uh, online uh, via Zoom and other tools, uh, video conferencing and so on and so forth. To try to minimize the contact uh, with uh, unnecessary other or things that can be avoided, contact that can be avoided as far as possible. Uh, we do have a crew uh, that is uh, working uh, at the office, so it's business as as usual, except uh, we're uh, you know just uh, cutting down on uh, contact with uh, people and clients. Mm -hmm. And how 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 do you find uh, our legal system adapting to the new norm? Because following following your page, I see that uh, you know, a lot a lot of uh, hearings have been put online as well. Yes, uh, you know I think. Uh, we've adapted really well, really quickly. Um, we've had a lot of time uh, and we've learned from the last MCO. Uh, you find that the courts uh, are now uh, conducting trials and hearings online. Uh, we have an e-filing system uh, that allows us to file uh, our documents online. Um, so, so we're pretty much okay. We're good to go this time. You know, So it's pretty much business as usual. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's so it's a provision of legal services. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So usually we hear that there are a lot of hiccups when it comes to uh, government tech, but has that been uh, your experience with the legal system? No, actually, uh, you know, we, we have a very good chief justice who's uh, acted very swiftly and very prudently in the way that she has uh, handled the administration of the courts, uh, especially when litigation is concerned anyway. Uh, and, uh, you know, even the numbers of, even when we did used to have uh, trials or open court trials where people would go to court in between uh, now and the, the end of the last MCO, uh, there were very strict SOPs in place. So before you went into the court, you, you would have to register with uh, uh, the necessary app and then uh, check your, your reading before you're allowed in. And if, even if you're allowed in, only a certain number of people are allowed in open court, you need to ask permission from the court if you exceeded certain number of uh, witnesses or clients. Um, so it was all very well regulated. I don't think we had any problems in the courts uh, right up to now. Uh, so, uh, you know, kudos to the, the people who administered the, and sorry, kudos to the Chief Justice and her team. Uh, and we're back in business really. Okay, good. good to know. And uh, what, what are your thoughts on the current, uh, well, the response so far from the government in terms of uh, managing the lockdowns uh, ever since March? Well, you know, if you look at the numbers around the world, um, and if you look at what's happened in the US or the UK, where they have responded too slowly, or they have dithered, or they try to put the economy ahead of the safety of people and things like that, uh, in many parts of Europe, you know, the numbers are staggering. Uh, somehow or other, we, we managed to um, get our act together. I, I, you know, the government did well. They imposed the first lockdown and, and that really flattened the curve. Uh, we're in a second or third wave uh, currently. And uh, 
I think uh, I have full confidence that we'll be able to come through this with the me uh, as long as people stick to the measures uh, that have been put in place. I'm sure the Ministry of Health um, has looked into this thoroughly and they, they are, uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident since they managed to help us uh, through the first round, I'm quite sure that they'll, they'll do that this time around as well. We were one of the top countries actually in dealing with COVID, so, so that, that says a lot, yeah. Yes, I, I totally agree, yeah. And then it's, it's just the occasional hoo-ha where it seems like there, there is a disconnect in the communication between the uh, federal government or the National Security Council and uh, the, on the state level. So we, we heard the hoo-ha uh, with the Klang uh, Council and then now Selang, uh, but it seems that uh, they seem to uh, have worked it out in the well, end. You know, I think, uh, to be fair, uh, this happened earlier on as well. Now, it's very annoying for businesses and people not really knowing or not being very clear as to, to uh, what they can do or what they can't do, uh, and especially people who are running businesses, you know. Um, but yeah, I think we have to put it in perspective uh, that, uh, you know, we're, we're not in a, uh, it's a novel situation. It's the first time it's happened, and uh, I think we have to give the benefit of doubt to those in power, and they, they, they're trying. And then they, they have come out uh, and clarified as quickly as they can. So, you know, under the circumstances, um, we should focus on trying to keep people safe and, uh, you know, maybe uh, not focus so much on all those other issues. Yeah. Yeah, yeah certainly. Yeah. Because I see there are also a lot of uh, political commentators who are saying, oh, we want a consistent uh, uh, response, you know, to. Uh, as as the crisis unfolds, right? But at the very same time, it's because, as you mentioned, we are dealing with a novel situation. How can you be consistent with your response when you're getting new information uh, about uh, COVID? Exactly. I mean, you you know, one day you see Clang has X number of cases, one day you see Culling has suddenly a surge. Uh, you know, so I think it's very difficult to uh, actually deal with that because it's a it's a daily thing and it's happening uh, almost instantaneously and uh, you know I prefer to focus on on the efforts uh, and focus on the people out there that are trying their best um, applaud them the frontliners and uh, hospital staff um, you know the hospitals are stretched at the moment and so I'd, I'd rather keep the conversation about these people who are the heroes rather than yep. you know uh, who caused what? Yep. Just to put things in perspective. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, certainly. And you know, what what do you feel is the difference between uh, our country as compared to most of the Western countries, where they feel, oh, you know, it's all about uh, liberty and freedom, uh, rather than uh, taking care of uh, one's uh, community, for example. I think I think the the Asian mentality is to obey, to follow authority. Uh, certainly in Malaysia, a lot of people, they do understand that they have to obey the laws, they have to follow authority and, uh, and maybe it's the way that we are. Uh, however, overseas where you have a, a fundamental uh, sort of um, uh, movement on rights and things like that, uh, you know, sometimes it can be a bit misguided. Um, and also, you know, you find that in Malaysia, you don't find so much of conflicting media, um, not as much fake news uh, about the virus and and things like that, as opposed to the West. You know, in the West, yeah, you know, people come up with all sorts of fake news about the virus. Uh, people are not informed, uh, you know, and also uh, in the way that we are, you know, we're a much smaller country and we're able to mobilize very quickly our, our our system of, of government, if you want to call it that, or enforcement. Uh, so, for example, you know, they announce lockdown immediately. You'll have the police there. You'll have the roadblocks. You know, you will, you will, you will have that enforcement. Uh, whereas in other countries, it's much bigger, and it's it's not so easy to roll out the enforcement procedures and things like that, which then allow uh, for you know, different uh, responses because people may not just follow like in New York at one point, you know, everybody was in the beach despite the government saying, hey, 
uh, you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, right? Uh, so to a large extent, um, I think over here people just tend to uh, follow the lead and, and respect uh, the authorities, and also because over here I think we are, we, we are able to enforce things a lot better. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's, I totally agree with you, and you know I I feel that one one of the reasons why the West is so uh, polarized is also uh, I guess to a certain certain extent of uh, how free they are to express themselves. And it's, it's always been a question in my mind. Um, do you ever draw a line uh, around freedom of speech or do you allow it to go freely and then allow people to uh, eventually, amidst all of the chaos, rationalize out of it? Well, I mean, to be fair, there's, I mean, there's freedom of speech here as well to a large extent, you know, as long as it's not seditious or something. But yeah, and people are free to criticize the government if they, if they don't think it's right. And people have, you know, uh, bounds have been criticizing, other people have been criticizing the government. Uh, so I, I don't so much think it's a question of freedom of speech. I think it's just that over here, we tend to um, understand things in a way that um, we need to comply with rules and things like that. Um, and by and large, people do uh, comply with the law. You know, I mean, in, in other countries, they, 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 you know, you say you can't mobilize with people or people can't be outside and then they, there's a, you know, 20,000 uh, people gathering in a, in a park, you know, protesting. And what do you do? Do you send out the water cannons? What do you do? <laughs> uh, so at the end of the day, it's also about uh, how people respond to authority. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so I mean, so, so amidst all of this uh, CMC or COVID, uh, what do you think about uh, Anwar's current uh, timing with his, uh, well, shall I uh, call it the Anwar move or uh, Le Meridian 2.0? Well, I don't think anybody could have legislated that we would have a, a third wave uh, coming uh, when it did. Um, I don't think it was anticipated that we would be in a CMCO. So to be fair, um, I think uh, if you look at it from Anwar's point of view, uh, you know, he's been very patient. Uh, I mean, based on press reports, of course, I, I, I only can uh, maybe uh, comment based on what I've read. Uh, you know, there's, there's a motion for no confidence, I think, that's in the parliament, but it's not been brought up. Um, yeah questions as to, you know, whether there is a majority or there isn't a majority uh, behind the government. Uh, so there's no vote of no confidence. Uh, so we have a prime minister that's still sitting um, and a government that's running. Um, so when, when do you time it? I mean, you know, to be fair to him, what's, when's the right time? Yep. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. And I, I think after listening to uh, Anwar's press conference as well, uh, he's, he's very level-headed, you know, as, as you mentioned, always still patient. And uh, uh, he always says, allow the due process uh, to go on and uh, everybody remain calm. And but it, it, it seems that uh, from, from the reports uh, that he's given the numbers to uh, his Royal Highness uh, uh, of his 121, but uh, without a list of names. And so the Istana came back and said, uh, they, they need to follow uh, according to the federal constitution. And so, yeah, can, can you share more uh, with us about this whole okay. process? Okay, first I, I have to say that I, I am apolitical. Uh, it means I, I don't, I'm not slanted either way. Uh, I think if you see my cases and, and uh, my comments, um, I'm not behind any polit particular political movement. Uh, I'm also not a card-carrying member of any political party. So I guess uh, you could say I'm as neutral as it gets, in a sense. Uh, okay, for me, I think, you know, people can only uh, support someone if they believe in what they stand for, or that person stands for, and that's a constitutional right that every uh, Malaysian has. 
Uh, and then if you look at today's press conference, uh, Anwar Ibrahim did come out and say, hey, listen, um, you know, uh, I believe in the independence of the judiciary. I believe in uh, the rule of law. I believe in following the constitution. I believe in reforming um, the government institutions. Uh, now, these are all things that, that resonate with the general public, you know, uh, if you look at what happened in the last election that we have, you would, you would think that this is something that most Malaysians want. Um, so, if, if uh, Anwar believes that he has a number, um, and, uh, you know, he believes that uh, so much, it's, not, it's not so much whether Anwar has the numbers or not. The, I think the, the real issue is, does the sitting prime minister actually command the support of majority? I think that's, that's the, the real question to ask. Uh, now, whether that you know, message that has been sent to the king is by way of a letter or a list of, of uh, MPs is irrelevant. Uh, there's nothing that says he has to give a list of MPs. The only question really is uh, whether the prime minister commands uh, the majority. Uh, support in, in uh, Parliament. Uh, and so if it's brought that point to the Yang Diputuan Agong, then uh, quite rightly, the Yang Diput the palace, he, Anwar himself has said he wants to follow the constitution. Uh, and the palace has said they will consider it and look at it from a constitutional point of view. So that's, that, that's, that's a very good uh, position that has been taken. Now, you have a sitting prime minister and it's very different from the last time uh, with Tun. So the question really arises, uh, uh, what happens now? Okay. Now, the, the king with a sitting prime minister, as far as I understand it, uh, the king can't just say, hey, you know what? Uh, you don't hold the majority based on what uh, Anwar's list says or whoever says. And so, um, you know, I'm going to appoint X, Y, Z as uh, or whoever he chooses to be the next prime minister, that is not constitutional. So you have Article 43 of the federal constitution, uh, which sets out the process. And in this in this instance, uh, you have to have uh, different possibilities before uh, anyone can say that uh, they have a right to be appointed as a prime minister. Um, firstly. You know, it would it would be different if the sitting prime minister Tan Sri Muhyiddin uh, resigned. Uh, there's no indication that he's going to resign, um, and uh, there's nothing to say that he should. There's there's, there's really um, I mean, other than than what's uh, been said, uh, really government has been going on and uh, they've been passing bills. Uh, you know, you had the COVID Act that that was just passed. Um, so for an analyst uh, who's independent. You know, you'll be saying, "Hey, you know, this doesn't look like a government that's um, that's that's not in control, or does not have a majority uh, prime minister, does not have a majority in parliament." I mean, I'm just analyzing that as a as a situation. So, if uh, Tan Sri Muhyiddin does not resign, then uh, the next step could be uh, a vote of no confidence that is passed in parliament. Now, I believe that there has been um, I believe that there has been a motion, but whether or not that has been debated, I don't know. I mean, I've heard, to be honest, uh, I can't confirm. Um, and so the Prime Minister could say, hey, you know what, uh, Parliament just convene and, and decide once and for all, because um, you can't overthrow a sitting Parliament, uh, sorry, uh, Prime Minister, unless you, you, you uh, pass a vote of no confidence against him. In Parliament, uh, and if it, and even if it doesn't go through a no, vote of no confidence, generally, for example, if uh, uh, the budget doesn't get passed, then it's it's generally taken as a vote of no confidence, and then in such a situation, convention would have it that the prime minister would, would resign, uh, as that would be indicating very clearly that he does not enjoy uh, the majority um, support in Parliament, right? Uh, of course. The other option is for either Muhyiddin Yassin to uh, dissolve parliament, ask the king uh, to dissolve parliament and have snap elections. 
um, in which instance then then we go in uh, to a fresh election uh, fresh election and, and see what happens like like what happened in, in Sabah recently. Um, so I think those are as far as I know the the only possible outcomes uh, coming out of this scenario yeah hmm. so so given what you've shared and from your own personal analysis uh, would you say that uh, Anwar doesn't have the numbers uh, given that you said all oh, bills are being being passed and uh, all the action so far no I, I, I don't uh... I'm not saying that. I'm saying that um, in relation to, you know, why would the prime minister want to resign uh, to people out there? Uh, it seems like it's business as, as usual. It doesn't look like a government that's, that's having a, you know, a crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, but then having said that, you know, with politics in Malaysia, you know, like, like what happened when, when uh, you know, Tun Mahathir resigned and all that, then nobody predicted it just happened, right? Um, mm -hmm. Suddenly there were people that just pulled out um, and the government fell. So, uh, you know, he probably does have the numbers um, because I, I would find it really strange if he went to see the young Diputuan Agong without uh, really believing that he had the numbers. So, you know, it's, it's not clear to be fair, you know. Okay. And so, so we, we see that Malaysia is constantly facing uh, these uh, political crisis uh, of uh, frog jumping, as, as they call it, right? So what, what, what do you think is the problem? Uh, is there a problem with our uh, political system or is the system good as it is, but it's just a matter of bad characters playing, playing in this political game? Well, if you look at the oath of office uh, that a minister has to, sorry, as, a, as an MP has to take, you know, they, they swear an oath of office. And that oath of office is very clear that uh, you have to have a certain amount of integrity. You know, you take that oath of office. And uh, when you take that oath of office, you're there by virtue of what you've represented to the people. You know, what you've said to the people to get them to vote for you. And people who vote for you, they usually vote for you because you, you're under a certain banner, right? You can say they voted for me because of me, but at the end of the day, then you should have gone as an independent. But usually a lot of these MPs go under a certain banner. Um, and these, so the representation to people is, I may not like you, but I'll vote for you because I want the party that, that, that you're under to, to, to run the government. Um, Having said that, and, and because of that, and the, the oath of office, I believe that uh, to then, uh, after having been elected, to switch uh, camps to another party, I think is is um, perhaps morally wrong. Um, in that, in the in the instance that you you know sort of uh, given that oath and and you've made those representations to people that relied on it and put their trust on it. Uh, and I think in such a situation, if you feel that you can no longer uh, do your best for the party, then, you know, like it, it happens in other countries, then you should resign and, um, you know, uh, withdraw. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just sort of, that, that would be, be generally what, what someone uh, would do. Unfortunately, in Malaysia, people have a different perspective of things. Uh, to be fair, there's, there's no law. Uh, that stops people from from doing that, from from hopping from one party to another, and uh, you know, having said that, look, you know, it, it still boils down to the people. It still boils down to us uh, because we vote for the same people anyway after they they uh, jump ship, and we vote for them again and again and again. So who's to blame? To who's to be blamed? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the politicians or the people, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so we have to um, look at ourselves and 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 look at how, uh, you know why we we're voting and and what we can do about it. Yeah. So I, I see that this plays into what you just posted uh, just just about three hours ago, uh, and I quote: uh, "Upholding the rule of law, reforming the institutions of government, and preserving the rights of all citizens. What every one of us should be striving for." Now, I guess... Yeah, well, you know, because you see, I'm a creature of statute. Uh, uh, as a lawyer, 
Yeah. Uh, I'm bound by the Legal Profession Act. And uh, so as a lawyer, you, you would, who understands the law, you know, you would say that we have to protect the constitution. We understand the constitution. We understand the importance of the rule of law in civil society and in, in, in progress. We understand that uh, we are there to protect rights, uh, human rights, uh, citizens' rights. So all of that is very consistent with, with um, what we're trained to do and, and, and what we're taught in law school. Yeah? Yeah. And so how, how is it that uh, everyday citizens can hold our politicians uh, accountable, given that, uh, like as you mentioned, with all of these party hopping, it's not legislated, right? So how, how can uh, the people on the ground hold their, the politicians accountable before the next uh, election comes? Well, you see, that's, that's the thing. Uh, once you elect them into power, then... Uh, what is there, you know, unless the person dies mm. or, yeah, or, or resigns or withdraws, then, you know, there's really not much you can do except wait for the next election and, and vote somebody else in or stand up and, and, and take responsibility. You know, there are a lot of people who, who sit down in coffee shops and they, they talk, but they, you know, why don't you stand as an independent? You know, why don't you put your message out and across, you know? take some responsibility. Uh, so you can't actually sort of blame the general public because at the end of the day, you don't want to do the big dirty work. You don't want to stand up. You don't want to put yourself forward um, as an MP or something. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not criticizing people. I'm just giving a different point of view, uh, a different perspective to, 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 to what people generally think. You're absolutely right. Uh, and I agree with you. Uh, don't get me wrong. I agree that uh, you know people are left uh, very uh, frustrated, you know, especially after the last election. Uh, clearly, uh, you had a government that was voted in, and then uh, it, you know they, they kind of had to be booted out, not by the people, but by 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 uh, political uh, sort of coup d'état, mm -hmm. right? So is that the will of the people? No. Um, I think if you look at it, uh, it's not really in terms of the ballot box, the will of the people. So what would, what would, what would you do? You would have to wait until the next elections and uh, vote somebody else in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Uh, but, but let me just add to that. Um, let me just add to that. I think you, you have to put everything in perspective. Okay. Uh, if you look at what was happening at the time uh, at which the switch took place after two years of the government being in power, uh, you have to understand that, that sometimes uh, these people move for different reasons as well. A lot of people were disenchanted with the government that, that, they, that they voted in. You know, um, I mean, it's popular news. I mean, it's out every day. I mean, um, the, you know, the, the opposition that came into power at the time uh, people generally, people in, uh, in the public, they, you know, they were they were asking why haven't they fulfilled their manifesto? They said they were going to change certain laws. Never happened. They could have easily done that. Never happened. Uh, they said they were going to abolish the toll. Never happened. You know, so a lot of promises that they made, uh, they also didn't fulfill. So, uh, you know, so and then you know, if people go to the MP and say, hey, you know what, you said this and that and the other. And, uh, you know, so, so it, it's, it's not just, uh, I, I don't think you can look at it just in one sort of dynamic. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's multi-spectrum yeah. uh, argument. Yeah. Yep. yeah, certainly. And I mean, that, and that, that again comes to uh, accountability, where it seems that because of how the political system is uh, designed, it seems that uh, whichever party or whichever leader that comes out and gives the promises uh, uh, or the, the most, most goodies to, to people or plays to the tune to what people want to hear will eventually win uh, this political game. Right? But the, the truth is sometimes uh, uh, populist policies or what people want 
to here is not good for the nation uh, as well. So where do you strike uh, that balance, uh, if at all? Or, or you know, would, would you just suggest to politicians, hey, don't play that game, be of integrity, stick to uh, your principles, and be frank, even if it's not what people want to hear, which may cost you the election. No, I think I think it, it goes deeper than that. I think politicians uh, should start by by wanting to serve the people uh, and not serve themselves or their ego or their quest for power to stay in power. Now, if you remember, I, I remember in the early years uh, when I was young. You know, you found uh, at that time the BN government was 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 pretty much entrenched. And you had uh, a very uh, multicultural position uh, taken in government, a very multicultural position taken on government policies. Uh, you find that the people who came forward to um, lead were were people like teachers and and civil uh, not civil servants, but you know ordinary folk. You know, uh, even Tun Mate was was uh, was a doctor. You know, I mean, not professional politicians uh, per se. And you found that um, uh, in, uh, initially, I think you, you didn't have so much of uh, what people claim to be corruption and you don't see the numbers. You don't, you know, not like any of the MACC cases that, were, that, that are before the courts, you know, or these type of allegations. Let me, let me clarify that. Uh, you know, so you generally found that, 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 that um, you know, Politicians were there to, to, to help the country and build a nation, and, and they did that. Uh, but then in the, in the 1980s, uh, you found that, uh, and, and there was no money, by the way, just, just, just to let you know, in the old days, uh, you couldn't take money from the government because you had, everything was private, uh, was uh, nationalized, right? So you have LLM, you had uh, telecoms, you had, uh, so um, Malaysia, they were, they were all nationalized industries. And so all the money from these nationalized industries, they went to the, uh, it went to the, the treasury, the government treasury, and, and that was it. It was all accounted for. So there was very little opportunity to, for, for, for uh, sort of these assets uh, and any of the benefits to trickle down anywhere. However, in the 1980s, when, when we started to corporatize these um, uh, national assets, that I spoke about, uh, turned them into GLCs, and then we privatized them, and we, and we, 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 we then put them into the market. Um, what has happened is it's, it's allowed for that process to, 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 to move some of that benefit out of the treasury without really having that kind of accountability, you know? Um, so I think the first thing is, um, uh, sorry, I digress. The first thing is I think we need people that who, who step up, who want to serve, and not to be power crazy or whatever, not for power, not for money, not, not career politicians, you know. Um, I think the second thing that we need uh, are people that are sort of educated, you know, like, like Singapore, you know, you find the class of politicians there are, are much different. Um, and uh, thirdly, I think that uh, you, I think what we need to do is we need to, to, to come away from this position that uh, okay, so you are MIC and you are MCA and you are whatever and you have got two seats so you get one minister's post, you get one minister's post, post and you get, I mean, it, it's more on how many seats you get and then you get to be a head of a GLC or you get to be Minister of Defence, for example, even though you have no qualifications to do that. You get what I mean? Yeah. I think that you need to, you, find, you, you need to find people that are capable of doing so. Somebody uh, in the Ministry of Defense, for example, must 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 understand it. People must, you know, you must have people who are diplomats who are going to go out, who are trained in the art of diplomacy. You know, uh, you need the right people to head uh, GLCs, uh, not just political appointees. You know, um, and and so you need to start looking at the whole structure of these uh, institutions. And I think in that regard, we really need to have a reform in that sense, you know? Yep, yep. And I, I, I think one, one of the key issues is that uh, with the political narrative, it's still very much about race. 
So, so yes. therefore, all that's where all these quotas and uh, allocations still still exist, rather than being able to communicate on the level of uh, meritocracy. You know how 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 is it that uh, these positions are filled uh, on the basis of merit, and do do you find that uh, Malaysia can eventually get <laughs> get there? And uh, if so, what what would it take? To, to be able to build a society based on merit? See, the, the idea of merit uh, and the idea of success uh, are two different things, you know. And so, uh, it's how you define success that, that, that really matters, okay? So here you say, oh, we need this quota, we need to have that quota, and, and you're doing great and all that. Listen, ask you a question. If the Olympics, uh, and they had quotas, right? And somebody won. Would that person actually have the the the, the right to say they're the best, or have the fulfillment of being the best, or be compared as the best? No, because that wasn't the best person out there. You know, it was it was structured in a way quotas and things like that. And and it's the same thing. You know, if you take uh, meritocracy away, then are you really the best student? Are you really the most capable? Are you really uh, the, the one that deserves to be out there? You know, um, now meritocracy is very important, especially when it comes to the GLCs that, that contribute quite a lot to the government. And you found that in the past, um, it's no secret we've had scandals, right? Uh, you've had Mara, you have had BBMB in the old days, uh, masks several times over, of course, you can't forget MD, one MDB and, and so on and so forth. And this constantly happens to GLCs, government control companies. Um, and then you have to ask yourself, uh, why is that the case? I mean, can you imagine if you had a CEO, independent CEO of a company like Apple, for example, and the, the CEO just didn't do a job or didn't, provide the kind of profits that, uh, or didn't make the kind of profits that the, 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 the company, uh, sorry, uh, has, has decided to, to, to have, then you find that um, the CEO will, 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 will uh, resign, okay? Sorry, I, I just realized I'm running out of battery. I'm going to have to go soon. Yep, 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 yeah. So, yeah, just, just to be quick on it then. Uh, so, would you say also that uh, essentially the leaders that we see uh, who are in power right now is a reflection of uh, our society. Uh, yes, certainly. Ag- yep. mm-hmm. Certainly, I think uh, yeah, not just a uh, reflection of society, a uh, reflection of our education system, reflection of how we, in a way, you know, we've not progressed in our way of thinking beyond race and religion. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we compare with our neighbours. Uh, you find that uh, 25, 30 years ago, we were ahead of most Southeast Asian nations in terms of the amount of um, capital that we could bring in and attract into this country. Currently, I think we are right down there somewhere. You know, it's not just, and everything from football to whatever, you know, list of ranking of universities. And it doesn't seem to be a problem for anyone. <laughs> we still consider Chago Kampong yep. <laughs> in our Kampong. That's right. Yep. Okay, so yeah, just just to uh, get on quickly to the topic of uh, the USA versus China, right? Yeah. So uh, you you've got an interest in uh, China, and uh, your your firm uh, has been there for quite uh, some time as well. Yes. And uh, given given China as this uh, rising superpower and uh, them asserting their power uh, in in the world right now, uh, do you think? Uh, China is is a good force, or have they been uh, overstepping in certain areas? For example, like in the South China Sea, and uh, certain comments about um, uh, them enabling uh, uh, corruption in in uh, uh, certain countries and buying over assets. Uh, so, so I can stick my uh, charger in the, in, the, in the phone and continue because I think this is a very, very interesting topic that I'd love to talk about a lot longer. So yeah. you'll have to take a break for about five, two to three minutes. But let me just, before I go, 
uh, say something. You know, the press and the international press, uh, they they skew uh, uh, public opinion, and they they you know it's 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 uh, it's it it never brings a, a very uh, clear story to the rest of the world. You know. Um, and I think, uh, uh, in this regard, to a large extent, I think uh, uh, the West versus China um, is really a situation where uh, you find, uh, as historically has shown, when one civilization um, uh, comes to its end, another begins. And you always find that during that time, uh, there are certain traits um, that people try to, you know, sort of uh, mask the realities of a failing uh, civilization or a failing um, empire, rather. I, I think empire is a better word, a failing empire uh, by pointing the blame somewhere else. I mean, you found that in Rome, uh, when the Roman Empire was crumbling, they tried to deflect attention to the gladiators to keep people happy. You know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. And I think to a large extent, you, all the indicators, if you, if you read uh, some of the, the more notable um, uh, writers like Chomsky, uh, you'll find that they uh, all, all concur that, that the um, empire, the Western uh, egalitarian empire, empire is, is actually uh, falling. All the indicators are there. And so uh, China's a great scapegoat. You know, and uh, but they they do have more than two hundred years of, of infrastructure in terms of finance, uh, global domination, uh, networks, and things like that. Uh, that they they are trying to sort of struggle to survive, and they, it's a, it's a question of survival right now. You know, um, and I think that's the case. And it's not just me saying that. I think if you look at uh, sort of some some reasonably uh, neutral analysts. Uh, they say the same thing. Now, that's not a reflection of how good China is or how great China is or that, that, that uh, China isn't uh, doing what any other superpower wouldn't have done or have not done. Uh, but uh, I think to, to put it in perspective, I think you need to take a very neutral global look on this. Um, and on that note, I'm going to pause here uh, so that I can get my charger. So if you give me two minutes, I'll be back and I'd love to talk about this topic. Sure. Yes. We will catch you soon in two to three minutes time. Sure. Yeah. So everybody, what do you think so far with uh, our discussion with Dato David uh, Guru Patam uh, as he is going to uh, switch over to his phone right now? Please share in the comments uh, section below. Okay, and the man himself is back. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I haven't. Uh, trying mm -hmm. to, I'm trying to go out of this uh, page at the moment. Um, ah, okay. Yeah. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Great seeing you join us, uh, Teacher Kian, uh, Brian, Zarif. See your comments right here. So, what are your thoughts, Facebook? China, are they a good force for the world right now, where we're at? And uh, what do you think about the US? Uh, how's Trump's response uh, to China? Or is Trump good for the world right now? Yes, and DJ Ken here says, I think Dato is very astute. Some of his commentary I would never have thought of myself, honestly. Refreshing. Yes, indeed. And I thought, you know, what a great way to start off the very first session of the Thinker's Lounge Live uh, then with Dato uh, David Guru Patam. So I'm very fortunate that uh, he took his time to join us uh, and to share his insights. Because let me share, share with all of you more about what uh, uh, sparked me to start the Thinker's Lounge. Essentially, I felt that 
the world is constantly being polarized by uh, opposing thoughts and opinions. And I wanted to create a space for rational discourse to bring out the best ideas. And I find that uh, at the end of the day, when you create this space, you are able to allow the different thoughts to flow and eventually you will come to the core. And what is that core? That core is the truth. And I, I believe that there's a lot of people who say, oh, it's very important to stand by your truth. But at the same time, it's important to understand that your truth or my truth does not necessarily equal to the truth. There is an underlying base reality that of the truth that we have to get to. And I feel that if we are true to ourselves, uh, we are all essentially searching for the truth, right? Otherwise, we will gaslight ourselves and uh, we would essentially be uh, steering away from the truth and then we'll come crashing down as they call regression to the mean. And uh, if you read uh, the works of uh, George Soros, he made billions and billions of dollars just uh, based on this fact that uh, society, the markets, they, they stray away from the mean, right? And, and as, as this cycle perpetuates itself, uh, it just keeps building to greater and greater uh, polarizing extents before it becomes unsustainable uh, where society or the markets are gaslighting themselves uh, away from reality and then they have no choice but to come crashing down uh, back to what reality is. Yes, certainly can. That's one, that's one way to put it. Democrats and Republicans have their own truths. That's why they're in this situation now. Okay, I'm back. Okay, great. Perfect timing. So, so yeah, I mean, you, you shared some very uh, valuable points. Of course, right now, there's a lot of psychological warfare uh, that's going on. Uh, both superpowers, the uh, China and the US or the West, they are trying to take control of uh, public opinion. So yeah, do, sh do sh share with us uh, on why, why is it that you think that China is uh, misrepresented? Like, I mean, is, is, are there not areas of concern uh, where, like for, for example, a Southeast Asian nation should be concerned of? Well, you know, I think you uh, you have to put, as I said, we have to take a, a more global perspective on this. Um, and I think that you, you find that different governments uh, over time, they they have different policies. And, and uh, so if you look at maybe what has accelerated this, this so-called uh, downfall in terms of this uh, Western um, civilization or this Western empire, really is neoliberalistic um, policies in the 1980s, uh, whereby you found that there was this whole movement to um, allow companies and, and millionaires to make more money, or the 1% to make more money, based on something called trickle-down e economics. So they said that you, know, you allow these big companies to earn a lot of money and all that money will trickle down into the economy and everybody would, would uh, earn a lot more. And in doing so, they demonized uh, institutions such as the unions. Unions were bad. Now, unions played a very vital role in making sure that, that um, wages commensurated uh, with inflation. You know, so generally, you found that in the old days, uh, one breadwinner could actually uh, provide for a whole family. You know, and today, two people working, you know, is still not enough. And that's mainly because uh, wages have not gone up with inflation and what has happened is you found all these big companies now um, having you know uh, being worth like a trillion dollars and so on and so forth um, and if you look at the Oxfam report in 2017 uh, it said that most of the wealth of the world or at that time 50% of the wealth of the world was in the hand of, hands of 1% of the population 
And so what has happened is they, they just allowed this capital to uh, move into various countries around the world and they've used the capital as a tool to, to wreak havoc in economies, right? So you find overheating economies. So basically a country could basically flood our markets, push prices up, and then, you know, when there's, a, there's, there's, there's a, um, an issue or where there's, there's a pull out, suddenly the, the market crashes. And what you find is your homes and whatever you've pledged to the bank to buy those shares, for example, in, in the stock market, it's gone, right? It happens all the time. And then what do you do? You go and buy their treasuries. When, when the equity market goes down, you buy the treasuries. So it's like, you know, they just circulate this, 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 this wealth and they keep taking that wealth out of the, the world economic uh, uh, system, you know? So by and large, what you found as a result of this um, uh, uh, neoliberalistic policy is a lot of these big companies that they said were supposed to make a lot of money and the money was supposed to trickle down. Well, what happened was they set up offshore uh, sort of banks and so on and so forth where all, all this money went offshore. And so you, what you find is around the world right now, you have a situation where income inequality is a very big thing. And income inequality has been driving, uh, it's the, the biggest factor in, in a lot of the Western elections today. And it's also something, it's phenomenal, not just in the West, it's also very dominant in all around the world, including in Malaysia, you find like in, 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 in my dad's time, for example, my father was a teacher and his salary was enough to take care of the family. They lived in a nice house, had a car. You know, today, two teachers' salary wouldn't be enough to, to, to have what my dad had at the time. And that's due to income inequality, right? Uh, so, so the West has come out with that kind of model, right? China on the, had, had largely been out of the system. Uh, so while the West had implemented the system, Malaysia, of course, did the same thing, opening up the markets, because they tell you open up the markets, then we'll, we'll flush your markets with, with capital and things like that. But to a large extent, China was isolated uh, from this process, right? Uh, but then what happened maybe about 30, 30, 40 years ago, on the other hand, was China realized that with the, uh, perhaps you could already see the indicators of what, were, what was happening uh, in, um, at that time, uh, the communist countries around the world, right? You found Eastern Europe, uh, you know, the, 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 the Iron Curtain, the wall fell down um, in the 90s, I believe. And that was without a single bullet being fired. That was because of an economic situation where the West had just completely, uh, the banking system and so on and so forth, uh, just dominated uh, world commerce that, those uh, countries in, in Eastern Europe, for example, they just collapsed economically. And then you found the same thing happened with Russia, you know, another communist country. Um, you know, under Boris Yeltsin, they, they just, uh, the USSR collapsed. And it it looks like... Uh... They, became, they, they, they moved into a more uh, situation. And so I think China, uh, and if I was China and I'm looking at all of this, I realized that look, my, the system could also be failing, you know. Uh, and so they, they perhaps they, they, they came to a realization that they, they could actually turn this around, still find a solution whereby they could still have their, their ideals as a, as, as, a, as a communist party, but also um, as a people's party. In their, in their view, it's, it's a people's party. I, I'd rather use a people's party. Not, I think communism is a, a bit of a misnomer. Uh, so, so then you have a situation where, I mean, to me, the reason why no difference is because 1% controls the politics in, in America. I mean, whoever pays uh, the, the funds, uh, you know, the, the so-called people that uh, put in the political funds actually control who gets to become the president. So to me, no difference uh, realistically in terms of politics, whether it's the People's Republic of China or America, to me, it's the same thing. Uh, but really, um, with China, I think uh, they did it in a very structured way. The, the Chinese did it in a very, very structured way. They, they set up uh, uh, special economic zones just to test it out, to see how that was going to pan out. And because of their low cost of manpower and the sheer size of the economy, 
uh, they were able to progress really quickly. And so you have uh, suddenly uh, moving on from 2000 to maybe 2010, uh, you find that uh, there's incredible progress in China. You just have to look across uh, the, the Pearl River in Shanghai uh, and you look at Pudong and you just see how Pudong has grown in, in 10 years or Guangzhou or, or Shenzhen and you see how, how fast this, 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 you know, this, the scale of it was, was amazing. I know because I've been traveling to China for business since 1996 and I completely, you know, was just taken in awe of this, um, of this, uh, the size and magnitude of, 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 uh, of the, the development in China. Uh, but, you know, because it's, it's a country that traditionally uh, has been very uh, controlled um, by central politics. And uh, why I try to, try to get an unbiased look at it is simply because uh, I think what people don't realize is the system of governance in China. Uh, China is a massive country. And if you look at historically, uh, the, you know, the emperors themselves have had, very, had it very difficult to control everybody. You know, they built a great wall, they had, you know, in, you know they, they burnt all the books, tried to put one language called Mandarin to keep people united. So to govern a country like China, uh, historically, uh, itself has been a challenge. And so if, if it wasn't done properly, what you'd have is perhaps like what happened to the USSR, you know, a complete breakup of of that, that union to several different republics. And then you would have um, a situation where, um, you know, because of the long standing uh, issues between clans and so on and so forth, you could have a very messy situation, I think, just looking at historics and China historically. So it was done in a very structured manner, right? And it was done in a manner whereby China soon became a major power, of course, right? But China then, does not have the consumption that the U.S. had, right? Because the U.S. can just print a trillion dollars. Uh, you know what I mean? And then, uh, and the people just spend that money on their, and largely on credit. I mean, they're the largest, they, they have the largest debt in the world um, compared to China. And uh, then you find that because consumption in the U.S. and China producing cheap goods, because the U.S. is a capitalistic model, you find China starts to produce, the U.S. buys a lot of things because it's a lot cheaper from China, right? It's, it's a, for, for whatever they want to do. Uh, just like it used to be with Japan and before that, South Korea. And then you have a huge trade deficit, okay? This huge trade deficit then is balanced by the issuance of bonds. In other words, IOUs to China. Listen, you know, I bought like maybe a trillion dollars worth of toys from you and now here's an IOU, right? I'll pay you some interest on it. And then you have a situation where now China's holding a lot of uh, US bonds and uh, now China is completely uh, going to be affected by whatever happens in the US. You know? and, and that changes the dynamics of the geopolitical situation uh, with the two countries. Uh, and the, the utter dependence of China on especially the US in terms of, of trade. And so the China, to me, the, I mean, just as an analyst looking at it, uh, China needed to change, uh, and, and, and you found that uh, because more and more uh, there seemed to be host hostility towards China, just like there was at a time when Jap Japan was doing really well and Sony and all these other Chinese companies, uh, Japanese companies were buying up swaths of uh, New York and, and uh, real estate in, in, in America. And what happened was the Americans played a money game, and I guess. Uh, and then you found the Japanese yen is stagnated and the economy has just stagnated since. You know what I mean? So, the, so the, the Chinese basically have a reference point for all of these things. And they're saying, hey, you know what? We've got to be really careful here because we're, we're, we're so dependent on the American economy, right? And so the Ch Chinese did something very smart. Um, what they did was because they, they're holding so much of U.S. debt, right, at, at, at certain premiums. And um, so I guess what they decided to do was, was export some of the value of that uh, to other countries like Southeast Asia, right after Africa, and um, basically uh, rebuild economies, put in infrastructure, uh, and get a foothold, improve their economies so that they then become consuming nations for China, increasing the consumption outside of the, the US. That was number one. And, and so China would, would not rely so much on the consumption 
of the US. Now, this is survival for a country. I mean, you have to think about it from that point of view as well. And they would then look to, uh, you know, this belt and road that came up in 2013. So China came up with belt, one belt, one road overall uh, policy in 2013, whereby they were going to put pump money into infrastructure and other assistance in, in all these surrounding uh, countries, improve the economic situation of these countries and, and hope that they would then turn into buyers for, for Chinese goods, which naturally should happen, right? Um, of course, there are certain uh, negative perceptions to what has happened. And part of them, uh, part of it may be dry. Some people say the Chinese money, that game and so on and so forth. Some of it is true, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll share some of my thoughts on it. But I, I'm here, I'm talking about general policy, right? Uh, not individual companies doing business. I'm talking about just a thought process as a, as a country, as a nation, you know, how, how you want to set your, your, your path forward in a way that you don't end up like some of the other countries that tried to do that and, and failed hopelessly, right? So One Belt and One Road was, was, a, was, a, was a fantastic idea. But then I think they realized that, look, they, they had a big problem because uh, the world was still using a de facto currency known as the U.S. dollar. You know, and and and, and uh, the U.S. Dollar, the, the, the U.S. could pretty much determine whether anything was going to work or fail by the way in which they priced the dollar, right? So you you know, can you imagine more investment coming in, overheating economies, and then uh, Chinese exports uh, companies now exporting or rather investing overseas, right? So a lot of Chinese companies were taking money out of China. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and because China tried to curb the, 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 the currency problems and what happened was capital was moving out of China into other countries. And so China had to, had to stop that, that movement of capital, you know. So you found, for example, uh, like now, you know, at one point you found people, Chinese people buying, you know, uh, developments, houses in, in Johor and things like that. Um, and all of that has stopped, you know. So you, what, what you're finding and what I'm seeing is really reactionary uh, positions uh, taken China like any other country wants to develop, you know, and, and the scale of China trying to develop is very different from the scale of uh, Malaysia trying to develop, right? And then you have this US dollar. So what the Chinese did was they said, listen, you know what, we need to get some of these uh, projects and, and some of this value denominated in currencies other than the US dollar. So they set up BRICS, B-R-I-C-S, which are Brazil, India, Russia, and China, coming up with a sort of de facto um, alternative central bank, all right, to beat the, to, to get around the central banking system, get around the US dollar, whereby the, the, the contracts will be de denominated in their own country. So you could denominate in Chinese yuan, uh, Russian uh, uh, currency or, you know, Indian currency or Brazilian currency. And, and, and that uh, would then allow for a more stable basket of currencies instead of the US dollar. And they tried to do that since 2013, but as of 2018, 40% of that Belt and Road uh, infrastructure is still denominated in U.S. dollars, right? So, so what you're finding here is 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 China really trying to grow, like any other country. It has its right to grow, except it's trying to do so without going through the traditional banking uh, central banking system. You know, the, the 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 and they don't need to because they they're, they're big enough that they can do it themselves. No other country can uh, get out of that. That, that sort, sort of central banking system and, and, the, and, the, and the way things are done. Uh, so I, I would say that, um, you know, that in that sense, China as a nation is quite entitled to do that. They're quite entitled to take their, their economic positions. I mean, I'm, no, I'm, I'm sure that Malaysia would do the same thing or any other country would do the same thing if they had to put their economic interests first uh, and their people's in economic interests first. They would, yeah. Now, let, let's talk about what people say, uh, the Ch South China Sea and, and so on and so forth. Now, if, if you look at how the, 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 the world has, has evolved over the last hundred odd years, all right, if, if you look at World War I onwards, whoever had dominion over shipping lanes and, 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 and control the seas really control the world, all right? So you had the Spanish, you had the British, you had, you know, the, the Portuguese, that they, they control the shipping lanes, you know, and they control the trade. The East India Company was able to take so much of wealth out of uh, this part of the world, you know, and, and that really uh, took a small country like 
uh, Britain into a number one country in the world, bigger than uh, at that time, the US didn't really have an economy, but you, you, you get an understanding of what these countries gain when they have a naval um, presence that's big enough that they can just do what they want, you know? And to a large extent, after World War I, you found that the Americans had military power and they have used that military power so many times over the years, you know, to, to just push through their, their, their own political agenda maybe, or their own, their own uh, national interests. You know what I mean? I mean, all, all I'm saying is that these are countries just like human beings. We're all trying to compete against each other to get ourselves forward. You know, who's right and who's wrong? You know, this is, you know, if you say this is business, somebody wins, somebody loses, right? Now, uh, but that's a Western philosophy. And, and, and China has, has evolved in a completely different way. So if, the China, if, so if China is trying to assert its rights in, in, uh, over the South China Sea, then, you know, there must be some, to me, it, it would look more of a, a security issue rather than anything else. You know, that's number one. Number two is if you look at how countries are destabilized by just having military uh, installations close to uh, where they are, you find that uh, this has caused conflict around the world. So, for example, when, when Khrushchev sent uh, ballistic nuclear warheads and parked it in Cuba, America and, and John F. Kennedy reacted, how can you do that? How can you put, uh, you know, nuclear warheads right at my doorstep? You know, they put an embargo, right? They didn't talk about free shipping lanes. They put an embargo there, correct? In, during the Cuban crisis, right? So it, it's no different. China is, is, is not reacting any differently from anybody else. Right? Of course, if you were Cuba or you were any other country like Jamaica down there, you'd be like Malaysia now fretting like, why, why the hell you guys are you know, putting your, your feet here, right? I don't like it, get out of my face. You know, you, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's a little fish that, that, that's, uh, you know, just chatting about, but they can't do anything when a great white shark comes in, right? <laughs> so it's, it's the same thing. You know, if you, if, if you look at it historically and you look at it in a very neutral way, China's not doing anything that the Americans aren't doing, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you talk about the debt traps, right? They say, oh, Chinese money, uh, being, you know, causing a huge amount of debt in, in, in these countries, not being able to pay back. Hey, listen, after, well, you know, the, the, the reason you had World War II was because the banks forced Germany to repay back loans at exorbitant amounts to rebuild the country. All right? So the West was doing this long before China was doing this, you know? If you look at how the West has taken up a lot of wealth from developing countries, you know, taking back loans that they've given to build infrastructure uh, through commodities and things like that. You look at Africa, uh, you know, for years, they've been virtually raped, you know, economically uh, through, through this type of uh, situations. It's no different. You know, China, China is, 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 is no different. Now, then you look into the individual uh, or the micro part of it. Okay. which is companies dealing with companies. It's not countries dealing with countries. So if China says, okay, there's a new policy, you do business, go and try to see what you can do in, 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 in Malaysia, and, you know, try to, um, you know, uh, get as many infrastructure contracts as you can. You know, let's, let's try to help uh, build some kind of uh, economic uh, corridor between Malaysia and China. I mean, that's, that's what happens uh, with any country around the world. Except if, if, if Malaysian companies then say, hey, you know what, I need to inflate this to, to be, for you to get the contract for this, that, and then, you know, there, there is a commercial deal there. Hey, that's, 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 that's not China. That's, that's you. you. You understand what I'm saying? If you say, hey, you know what, I want infrastructure so much, and it's easy money, I can get this easy money, and you can't manage it, then that, to a large extent, that, that's the fault of the government of the day, isn't it? I mean, it's like you you know, saying to the bank, hey, give me a million bucks, I'll pay you back, mm -hmm. right? When you know you can't pay back that million bucks, all right? And the bank says, oh, okay, you're my friend, I like you, you know, let me give you a million bucks, right? And then when you can't pay back the money and the bank says, hey, uh, you know, pay me the million bucks, you turn around to the bank and say, hey, you put me in a debt trap, mm -hmm. right? In the meantime, you bought a Mercedes, you lived in a big house, you put a swimming pool, blah, 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 and now mm -hmm. you can't pay back a million bucks. Now, I mean, I'm just saying, yeah. that in yeah. yeah, 
I, so, I, I mean, c- certainly uh, on, on, on that point, I guess the, the argument would be is that uh, China would, would be happily enable this uh, to happen uh, under, under the assumption that, okay, the general uh, public or the citizens of the country uh, would not wish for, for those funds to be utilized that way. But uh, only the minority at the top are uh, taking advantage of their positions. So what, what about that argument where China is enabling that to happen? Well, I, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's a question of whether you enable or not. Now, if you look at, you just do the math, right? If a country like the US is in debt by, I don't know what, 30 plus trillion US dollars, you divide that by the population of the US, right? You know how much every American citizen is in debt to yes. for no reason, mm-hmm. right? So is there any logic in that? I don't know, right? But at the end of the day, I don't think any country can say, well, my, my politicians, the ones that I've elected to be in power, uh, benefit from this, not us. And you know, I think that, that, would be, that would be wrong. You put the people in power, you're accountable for it. If you are now in trouble, that's your fault. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that, 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 that's the reality of it. It's, it, it's very easy to blame uh, the other side when you are suffering when your country now cannot provide uh, services because somebody took some money and there's a big Chinese contract and they have to pay back a loan. It's very convenient to say, oh, this is a Chinese debt trap. This debt debt, uh, trap. And it's very great for Western media to blow it up and say, oh, you know, this is a Chinese Shylock come for his pound of flesh. Mm -hmm. But in reality, you know, if you look at it from a very neutral and, 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 and logical point of view, then those people who were elected, if they cared about their people, they shouldn't have they shouldn't have gone into those um, kind of transactions in the first place. Would you go to the bank and borrow one million if you pay it back? No. Yep. Right. Right. And 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 then you you say, oh, but the people in well, the people voted those people in in mm-hmm. most most uh, countries, right? So I'm just saying, you know, uh, I'm not supporting China. I'm just saying that um, you know maybe you need to look at it from another point of view. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, because from yeah. from from what I'm hearing, it's I I totally agree. Uh, where you know if you're talking about just looking at it from a strategic point of view, what China is doing is totally rational. All right. Ask you a question, CY. Yeah. If 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 you had ten ringgit, would you give five ringgit to your neighbor knowing that he can't pay you back? No, I wouldn't. No, right. Yep. If you just wanted to help him out through a tough time. Mm-hmm. Right, and then when you ask for the money back, your neighbor turns around and say, "You put me in a debt trap." I mean, <laughs> yep, yeah, yeah. I, I so, don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I guess the <clears throat> the what, what people would be against is that you know we we understand the rationale behind how uh, China is playing the game, right? But the question is, uh, do we agree with the? Uh, ethics or morality behind certain maneuvers, certain strategies uh, of that sort uh, to well, take advantage you know of certain, certain uh, rules in this. Uh, uh, oh, really? Uh, you know, then, so did, 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 did the West play by the rules when they went, when they shoved globalization down the rest of the world? <laughs> well, certainly no, right. not. Yeah, certainly not. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I, I'm just, I'm not defending China. Yeah, I don't yeah, need yeah. to defend China. Yeah. I mean, China, like any other country, has, has its weakness, has its flaws. All I'm trying to say is that, you know, I think people just get on the bandwagon of, of Western media and, and, and just, um, I think the, 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 the thing is a little distorted. You know, this is, mm. I've been, um, you know, doing uh, work in China since 1996 when, you know, we started uh, looking at Shanghai Electric Company as one of the uh, EPC contractors for a power plant in Malaysia. And then in the year 2000, we were doing, uh, we were setting up uh, uh, Woofies, wholly owned foreign entities in the new economic zone. You know, we moved on and we started advising on contracts here. And now we also have a presence in China. And uh, you know, listen, I I have not uh, felt at any point in time that the communist governments were, were, were being unfair. I didn't think that they were they had any agenda. I, I believe that they were trying to trade. I personally had no issues. I have a firm uh, 
uh, in Jinan, China. Uh, so you can see that I'm biased, but why would I have a firm in Jinan, China if I didn't believe that that was the future? Uh, so I'm just trying to give a different perspective to what's out there. Yep, yep. So certainly, I mean, the, the, the position that you take is, is very much like what uh, Ray Dalio uh, stands, stands by as well. Right. Yeah, and you know, I, I totally get uh, the, the perspective and angle where you're coming from. So then what, what are your comments in terms of like uh, certain a areas of question when it comes to human rights or when it comes okay. to like what happened to either Xinjiang or uh, in Hong Kong, for example? Okay. Right. Um, let me ask you a question. Um, firstly, before I ask you that question, I'd, I'd like to say that I strongly believe in human rights. I don't believe that. Uh, any person has, can be violated as a person uh, as to their fundamental rights, right? The right to free speech, um, the right to li life and livelihood, the, re the right to a fair trial, you know, uh, these are all fundamental liberties and they are universal fundamental liberties and I stand absolutely for them, okay? Unfortunately, uh, while everybody talks about it, Nobody does it. Not not the U.S. who talk so much about it. But then, hey, uh, just to check, Guantanamo Bay still there? Or not? Yep. <laughs> it's still there. Yep. Right. So you get my point. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Malaysia. You know, they, everybody has a different version and mm. a different reason yep. for implementing certain things. You know, whether it's right or whether it is wrong. Um, that's very subject subjective. You know, I mean, you, if you ask the US why they got Guantanamo Bay, they'll give you 101 reasons. If you, if you ask them if you support democracy, why do you support the House of South, South with, in Saudi Arabia, which is not democratically elected, they'll have another reason for it. If you ask China, they will have a reason for it. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Yep. Right? So, at the end of the day, it does not take away from the message that every human being have, has fundamental rights and they shouldn't be violated. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be a question of, well, they're doing it, um, but then the others are doing it. You know, that's not the point. Nobody should be doing it. Yep. Yep. But what happens quite often is that people de try to destabilize mm -hmm. other countries. You know what I mean? Yep. It's like everybody tries to destabilize each other, mm -hmm. right? So the Americans, you know, were accused of destabilizing countries like Nicaragua, the Middle East, blah, blah, blah. Okay, the list goes on and on. The Russians were... Were, were accused of manipulating U.S. elections, you know. Uh, China accuses the West of man meddling and manipulating the Hong Kong situation, all right. Now, uh, yeah, are there these things? These things are there. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you read the book, Confession of an Economic Hitman. Mm. Uh, that's a good book to read and, and to understand how uh, there's an economic warfare that's waged through these type of efforts all around the world. Yep. You know, and it and it's it's more powerful than you know sending aircraft carriers and and, and nuclear bombs. You know, and, and economic warfare has been fought and has has succeeded in even I believe bringing down you know the Iron Curtain. Mm. You get I me mean, without a single nuclear uh, bomb being dropped anywhere. You know, so um, the reality is yes, it it happens. It happens in every country. Um, and I don't think that we should look at it in isolation. I think we should condemn it. Mm -hmm. I personally think we should condemn, as a society, we should condemn any country that is uh, violating human rights. Mm -hmm. okay, whether it's China, whether it's the US, whether it's Malaysia, mm -hmm. right? It should be condemned uh, because that's not what the, the, the United Nations Charter says, right? Uh, and we are part of civil society. We say we are, we are forward-thinking, we are, we are ahead. Um, and before we preach to others, we should certainly, you know, attend to that first. Yep, yep certainly. Yeah, and I, I, I like, I mean, it's essentially how uh, at the core of it, you know, I, I always see you coming to, to that point of personal responsibility. Who is it that you elect and put into power? And at the same time that from our discussion, I see that, you know, the, the, the issue is you've got all these powers playing for uh, their own interests, which they are definitely entitled to. 
which uh, results in them making certain decisions uh, which uh, may infringe upon human rights or may, may uh, take advantage of uh, other people's uh, uh, or other countries' situations. Do you see a way out of this constant back and forth of win-lose, win-lose? Is there a way, way out where no. we... You know, you know I, I, I spoke at a conference in Dubai uh, uh, several years ago, and I spoke about a clash of philosophy, okay? a clash of thinking between the West and the East, in particular the West and China. Okay? The Chinese philosophy has always been win-win. China always goes into a win-win situation. Okay, that's number one. I can't remember China invading any country or, or going to war with a certain any country other than reasserting its right over traditional uh, territory that they used to have. But going to war, I, I can't recall any time China actually went to war with a country. Uh, but certainly their, their, their policies, they always look at as win-win. You know, that's, that's a phrase. The West, on the other hand, they cannot understand win-win. For the West, I win means you must lose. If you win, that means I lose. If China win, America lose. America was mean if not China. America must win if not America will lose, for example. You get what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and this is a Western philosophy that I think China is struggling to, 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 to get to grips with. You know, for example, things like 5G, you see Huawei, you see China trying to come out, trying to do things, you know, and then the West going like, oh, we can't let China win. China win, we lose. We got to mm -hmm. stop. You get what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and this, this, this is not good for the world. You know, this is not good for the world. As history will, as history will show, historically, that's the way it's been in the West. You know, they, you know, you've had superpowers that. that crumbled, you know, economic power that crumbled, you know, and because they, they, they fought, they fought wars, they fought economic wars, you know, and, and under the philosophy that someone must win and somebody must lose, they fought religious wars, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and it's incompatible with, with the way that China, China's philosophy of doing business is. How many? Can we, can we win? Okay, I, I put some infrastructure for you. Can you develop? Can we, can we be friends? Can you, you know, develop? Can you trade with us, for example, you know? Um, so uh, to me, it's, it's, it's a clash of civilizations, it's a clash of philosophy, but make no mistake, the future is China. Yeah, and definitely. And with the way how China is structured, they, they can play the long game and they can just wait it out <laughs> as, as uh, you know, the Western countries squabble on, on to push within the power, right? So, You're absolutely yeah. right. I mean, China closed its borders uh, since the Ming Dynasty in 1600 mm -hmm. for 400 years. That dragon slept, mm -hmm. sound me, and then it woke up. It, it woke up in the 1980s and the 1990s. Mm -hmm. Since the 1600 Ming Dynasty, they closed down, and then it woke up. Mm -hmm. Now you have to deal with something that's there. Mm -hmm. You know, the world has to deal with something that's there. Whether whether that's good for the rest of the world, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's good that we have uh, such a dominant power in Asia, um, I don't know. I mean, usually if you've seen in history, countries that have a very dominant um, e economic uh, power uh, tends to use it to their advantage and to the advantage of the smaller countries around it, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so we have yet to see how this is going to pan out. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. So I think, I think a key problem also in, in the world where we live in, where there's tons and tons of information and conflicting information with different perspectives uh, and different mo uh, narratives surrounding it. What are the kinds of uh, mental tools uh, that you would recommend people to use to be able to discern the true uh, intentions of either a superpower or maybe even an individual, right? What, what are the tools that everyday people can use so that they can find the truth? I think the, the problem today is uh, 
people are just looking to the computer and, and they're looking to Google and they're saying like, okay, find me something that's not fake. Show me something that I can show that it's fake, fake news or not fake news. I think people need to just start reading, you know, read history, you know, read books, learn, go through documentaries, you know, read philosophers, look at analysts that, that uh, speak out, you know, uh, you know, how many people read, have read Chomsky, for example, or other authors, you know, um, I think you need to have a sound mind and to do that, you're not going to be able to discern fake news and, and press a button and Google is suddenly going to tell you that was fake news. I think you, I, I wouldn't trust that. Mm. I think people should read more, you know. Yeah, so certainly to to read more, empower oneself with uh, the knowledge of history, recognize its patterns, yeah. and then from there you will have the tools of uh, discernment. And yes, that's very Definitely. good. Yeah, so yeah, I think we all we've had a wonderful session. You know, Thank this, you. This this has been a great great start. Uh, I didn't expect it uh, to 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 last this long. But uh, thank you very this much. This is a thinker's lounge. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm just I just think differently. I guess you know. Yeah, but I mean, this this is exactly what I feel the world needs. Uh, you know, we need more more of these quality and refined thought that's put out into this world, and then for that conversation to continue. Yeah. Right, thank you very much, CT. Um, yes. So thank, thank you very much, Dr. David. And yes, thank you to all of our viewers. Uh, you know, if you enjoyed this session, please like and follow my page and go to my YouTube channel as well. Like and subscribe. And we will definitely be bringing more and more wonderful thinkers. And hopefully you join us uh, again uh, in, in a future session, uh, Dr. David. Uh, yeah, to this yeah. Okay, wonderful. Okay, great. Thank you very much, everybody. Have Thank a good you. night. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good night. Bye.